Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. Mits Mits Mitsubishi. Without them, our culture really would have nothing. Just to keep it simple, Mitsubishi really means a lot to me, and the rest of the world as well. That's right, I said world. I can't think of any company that has brought joy to so many people. Their products are loved universally. My favorite of theirs has got to be the MYGL12 NA. With its utilitarian design, it's unlike anything else on the market. With 12,000 BTUs of power and priced at a fair $1,300, it lands right in the middle of their current product lineup. I guess it's kind of like the Eclipse. When you hear the word Eclipse, you think of Brian O'Connor's iconic 1995 model from the movie The Fast and the Furious. These are the cars Mitsubishi was, and sort of still is, known for. Although most people think of Mitsubishi as making just cars, there is so much more to their history than that. Although the Mitsubishi Motor Corporation was established in April of 1970, the roots were traced all the way back to 1917 when the original Mitsubishi Shipbuilding Company released the Model A. No, no, no. Not that Model A. This Model A. The Model A is just a blip in Mitsubishi's history. Founded in 1870 by Yatsuro Iwazaki, the company was a shipping firm headquartered in Tokyo. And now, just a mere 150 years later, they've evolved to manage a bank, the trading industry, and their own separate heavy industry division which encompasses Mitsubishi Motors, Mitsubishi Atomic Industries, Mitsubishi Chemical, Hitachi, and Nikon for some odd reason. So instead of trying to encompass 150 years in just a 20 minute video, we're going to start in 1959 with the release of the Mitsubishi 500. The 500 was Mitsubishi's first car aimed at the masses. It came in two models, either a base model featuring a 493cc overhead valve two-cylinder, or the higher-end deluxe model, which featured a 594cc two-cylinder, making roughly 24 horsepower at the time. With the goal of seating four people and reaching a top speed of 60 miles per hour, the car really wasn't pushing the envelope, but it was a huge step in Mitsubishi's history as it was their first mass market production car. It's really hard to talk about Mitsubishi's history without first talking about their motorsports. This dates way before WRC. In fact, this 500 was their very first homologation race car. It competed in the 1962 Macaw Grand Prix under the sub 750cc class and absolutely dominated, finishing in positions 1, 2, 3, and 4. Seeing this victory, the Mitsubishi executives wasted no time coming out with a second car. The, the de, de bon, de bon, the debonair. We're going with the debonair. It's the debonair. The debonair, as Mitsubishi calls it, debuted for the 1963 Tokyo Motor Show and featured their very first inline six, producing about 104 horsepower. This vehicle was mainly aimed at a luxury market as opposed to the Mitsubishi's 500 consumer market. The vehicle did really well for the company at the time, really cementing it as a luxury automaker and someone that could produce a vehicle worth owning. Finding success with the debonair, Mitsubishi went back to the drawing board, and what they came up with was the Gallant, a compact car which came in either a two-door, four-door, or five-door configuration. By this point, the year was 1969, and Mitsubishi had sold about 75,000 cars. This must have been pretty good because in April of 1970, the Mitsubishi Motor Corporation was born. Now. What is the first thing you do when you start a new company? You sell 15% of it to Chrysler as a way to get into the US market. And from this merger, Chrysler is beginning to sell the Gallant as a Dodge Colt. It kept the same two, four, and five door designs, but was only offered with a 1.6 liter single cam engine. This did begin to work in Mitsubishi's favor because by 1977, their production had increased from that 75,000 number to 255,000 vehicles a year. But Mitsubishi was hungry for more. So at the end of 1977, they went global. Gallant started showing up in brand new Mitsubishi dealers across Europe and Australia. They increased their production to over 965,000 vehicles in just a single year. When you buy a new Mitsubishi built Dodge Colt or Plymouth Champ. This did not go over well at Chrysler, because at the time Chrysler was trying to push into global markets and the US gas crisis really hindered that. Chrysler was beginning to struggle hard. The Gallant was their lifeline as it was a cheap, fuel-efficient vehicle compared to their own offerings at the time. 
I'm just going to touch on some of the highlights of the Diamond Star Motors company. I could talk about this merger for hours, so if you want me to make an entire episode on that as well, drop a like on this video. Like I said, Chrysler was really struggling. They were not making much from those imported Mitsubishis, and their own product line was not generating much revenue. Mitsubishi then doubled down and started selling their cars right on Chrysler's turf and opened 70 dealers across 22 states. This increase in sales led to Mitsubishi's IPO in 1988. This allowed them to pay off all their debts. So, how does a company this big, with no debt, going into the best selling years they've ever had, manage to mess it all up? Where else to start than with I really don't know where to begin when talking about Mitsubishi's cars. Yeah, 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 we will get to that in a minute. I guess we can skip the uh, 500 and all the cars we did in the beginning and start here. The Starion might not be the most notable in the history, but it was really their first shot at a mass market performance car. Debuting in 1982 as the Mitsubishi Starion and Chrysler Conquest, the car featured a front engine, rear wheel drive layout, and came in either the 4G63 engine or the 4G54. Both were turbocharged and both were a huge step forward in technology at the time. The car itself, it kind of tried to copy the FBRX7, but then some of the designers thought, you know, maybe we should make it look like an FC. I don't know, it's kind of a mixed bag of both. Sadly, this car did not sell too well, and they're going cheap on Facebook Marketplace right now. Not a bad project if you're looking to get into something Mitsubishi. By the end of 1989, the Starion was dropped from most of Mitsubishi's showrooms in favor of the Eclipse. Utilizing Chrysler's D platform, this has to be one of Mitsubishi's more notable cars, featuring plenty of engines to choose from, and honestly a really nice design for the early 90s, or at least under three names, the Eclipse, the Talon, and the Laser. Just like the Starion, the Eclipse came powered by the 4G63, but this time, you could option it with all-wheel drive. This powertrain not only helped the acceleration, but the handling as well. Coupled with the fact that it had a really nice design, a second generation was inevitable. Alright, I think we all know what Mitsubishi's strong suit is, which is that small to medium displacement 4 cylinder that's turbocharged in an all wheel drive system, because the second generation Eclipse came with the exact same thing. The only thing that really changed was the styling. Again, this is Mitsubishi we we're talking about. The equipment was as bare bones as it gets. Even in the top trim models, most you could get was a leather wheel and shift knob, and only the driver seats had power options. This car was designed from the ground up to be focused around the driver and nothing else. Alright, the 3rd and 4th generations weren't anything special, that 4G63 was dropped in favor of a V6 option for those top trim models. It made about the same power as the 4G63, but you could not upgrade it as easily as a turbocharged engine. The 4th generation was definitely the better of those last two, but by the end of its 2012 run, man, this was a new car in 2012. At the end of its 2012 run, the V6 was actually making around 265 horsepower, you could get an option with the Roxford Fosgate sound system that had 9 speakers and a 10 inch sub. Not bad for a car that started around $20,000. Almost nothing from this 4th generation moved on to the 5th generation because- Oh, I'm not supposed to talk about this yet? Okay. Um... I know it's not the most interesting car, but I believe this was part of the reason for the downfall. Hear me out. So, we already talked about that 1st generation Gallant back in 1970. But I believe this car was kind of the reason for Mitsubishi's downfall. Being discontinued in the US market in 2012 along with the Eclipse, this car was responsible for keeping the lights on. As cool as the Eclipse and the Starion were throughout the 80s and 90s, the Galant was what Mitsubishi needed to make sales. This was your run of the mill, four door, five seat passenger car. You could get it with whatever engine, transmission, or features you wanted. At least that's what they want you to believe. But if you are in the know, of course, in this video, you'd pick yourself up one of these, the VR4. Featuring the latest generation of Mitsubishi's all-wheel drive system, it came with a tuned 4G63 pushing around 240 horsepower. Being a homologation special, it's tough to find one. Most you will see will be imported, but finding a USDM one is possible. They were only sold here up until 1992, but continued in Japan until 03. Looking back, you can really see a trend in these Mitsubishi cars. They are really good at the all-wheel drive four-cylinder formula, so much so that they decided to take it even further with the release of the 3000 GT. The base model, again, really nothing special. It was just front-wheel drive, naturally aspirated V6. So the one to spring for was that top-end model with all-wheel drive in the twin-turbo V6. The 3000 GT was Mitsubishi's answer to the Supra in the 300ZX. 
And it actually did a pretty good job. I mean, these engines can make decent power, and I love the styling of these cars. Fantastic. The official 0-60 to 60 of this car is around 5 seconds in the quarter mile time in the upper 13s. It came with some pretty cool features too. Active aero and a valved exhaust were optional in that VR4 top trim model. But do not be fooled by the appearance. This was not a sports car. It weighed in at almost 4,000 pounds. This thing was pretty much a grand touring car, but the path to upgrade is still there. Now, this is where I gotta talk about the elephant in the room with this car. It's its reliability. It's kind of a misconception. It's not notoriously unreliable like some people think. The real issue is that it's a super complex car running on essentially 1980s technology. Mitsubishi crammed that V6 into the engine bay, added two turbos, intercoolers, and the all-wheel drive system on top of that. Anything besides spark plugs and an oil change, and that engine has got to come out. It's a daunting task, and I sure would not want to do it. But if you got to pull the engine out, might as well upgrade everything because you sure as hell don't want to pull it out again. This has led to some super nice builds. Throttle comes to mind when I think of this car. When you take your time and build this car right, it's one of the best Mitsubishi's made. <sighs> All right, you have waited long enough. Bursting onto the scene in 1992, the Evo is the most recognizable car in Mitsubishi's lineup. Stealing both the all-wheel drive system and the 4G63 from that previous Gallant, the Evo produced 5,000 units as a homologation race car. The 4G63 was tuned to pump out 244 horsepower with a curb weight of just 2,700 pounds. It was a near instant success with tuners and racers. So much so that the first arc of Initial D Stage 2 is entirely about the Emperor Evo team as the main villains. These cars are a major part of what made Mitsubishi successful in the 90s, and the car was able to take on much more powerful and expensive Skyline Supras and 300ZX, all while costing a fraction. Here in the States, we did not get the Evos until the 8th generation. I've already started writing a whole separate video on the Evo itself, so be sure to hit that subscribe button if you don't want to miss it. The 8th generation featured the same 4G63 engine that the previous version used, but by this time the engine had been tuned to that magical 276 horsepower number and an astounding 284 pound-feet of torque. I really don't need to explain why this car was so powerful both on the street and on the track. That 4G63 itself was capable of 400 brake horsepower on a stock bottom end, and the car delivered a very raw driving experience centered around the driver and nothing else. Since this platform had been the top of Mitsubishi's lineup for over a decade now, aftermarket parts were very plentiful, and there were loads of setups you could configure the car for. Sadly, this drivetrain was eventually retired in 2007 with the end of the Evo 9. In its place debuted the Evo X, and showed off Mitsubishi's brand new 4B11T platform. The North American model came spec with 290 horsepower and was the final stone in Mitsubishi's evolution. Here at Mechanical High, we actually have several videos on Robbie's Evo X, so I'm going to link all those down below. Please go check those out. This is an awesome car. The Evo X did, however, receive a lot of criticism over its production run. And I can sort of understand why. The car did weigh significantly more than the previous generations, and fans were very quick to dismiss the new 4B11T. The engine, although not as revered as the 4G63 was, was just a better driving engine. If you have ever driven any Mitsubishis with the 4G63 in it that have some basic modifications, you'll soon realize that in street form, that engine's not everything it's cracked up to be. You have to do some major modifications to get that power out of it. You have to remember, the 4G63 was developed in the late 80s and utilized, again, 80s technology. Slow spooling turbos, low red line, and had to use ancient methods of tuning to even make power with it. As a daily driver, the 4B11T is a much better engine out of the box. Feel free to let me know why I'm wrong in the comments below, but the Evo X can be tuned with the Cobb Access port, you can make great power on simple bolt-on mods, and I dare say it, it's my favorite looking Evo, as far as the ones we got here in the States. Kaioichi's Evo 3 is still the best looking one, hands down. However, once Mitsubishi announced there would be no Evo 11, the car finally got the love it deserved. It's a really hot car for collectors at the moment, as prices on stock ones have started to skyrocket over the past couple years. The Lancer Evolution line ended in 2015 with the release of the Final Edition. This right here, this is how you do not end your company's greatest vehicle. It was only sold with the 6-speed dual-clutch automatic. It couldn't hold power as well as the 5-speed manual did, so you're going to want to stick with the GSR if you want an Evo 10. Since the car ended, I guarantee most of y'all have not heard from or about Mitsubishi. So think about it, where really is your nearest Mitsubishi dealer? I can't even think of one. Because even with all that history, those amazing vehicles, and the fact that Mitsubishi is so large that most people can't even comprehend how much money they have.
they still give us this. Now, I don't have the real reason that Mitsubishi is failing here in North America, but I have a couple of guesses. First, their cars are really never good. The competition had just not caught up yet. Cool, for all those still with me, let me try to make my point. What about these cars makes them legendary? It's the powertrain. The cars themselves were never actually good. They came with few features compared to the competition, but were cheaper, and they had the performance to keep up. These cars were really about performance on a budget and nothing else. And cars like the 3000 GT that tried to take a step into the luxury segment just didn't end up doing well. And in the 90s, this was okay. Cars really weren't all that great, so you got something that was as fast as an M3, just not quite an M3, but that didn't matter because with just a couple bolt-ons, there's a school bus size gap between the two. But when those early 2000s rolled around and Mitsubishi was still going strong, they were selling well into the 300,000 units per year. For example, in 02, they sold 360,000 units per year. But then they got too ambitious. In the year 03, to grab more customers, they released their 0, 0, 0 marketing tactic. Zero down, zero interest, and zero payments for the first 12 months. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what happened. People went out, bought the car they wanted, paid nothing, and then returned it after 11 months. After this, their sales dipped to below 100,000 units a year in the US. And remember what I said about the cars being nothing special? By this time, Honda and Toyota had caught up. The CRV and the RAV4 were both offering all wheel drive, similar pricing, and way better build quality than anything Mitsubishi could have. Plus, it's tough to compete with the reliability of Honda, Toyota, Subaru, especially when people still remember the Mitsubishi Chrysler merger of the 80s. Well, that was pretty much over by 1995, people still had it in their heads that Chrysler and Mitsubishi were in bed together. And any bad press Chrysler got for their cars in the mid-2000s fell right back on Mitsubishi. They just could not compete. They phased out all their budget performance cars except the Evo. And in 2007, they hatched a plan to cut costs within their business. This involved cutting all the slow-selling vehicles, releasing a base model Lancer aimed at the mass market, and eliminating 10,000 jobs. Their plan made sense on paper, Streamline manufacturing, cut overhead, release budget vehicles so anyone could afford them, but when you're already in a hole like this, it's hard to dig yourself out of. The Lancer just couldn't compete with the nameplate of the Corolla, and cutting jobs removed a portion of their workforce needed to make these units, which they were planning on selling. The Evo was not enough to keep them around. Even selling it unrestricted only netted about 22,000 vehicles over the production run of the Evo 10, and now in year 2021, they've sort of faded into obscurity, to put it in perspective, in 2019, the Mitsubishi Motor Corporation of North America sold a total of 121,000 vehicles in the United States. Just the Corolla alone? That sold 304,000 units in the same year. And that's just one vehicle. How do you compete with that? Now, at the end of 2021, Mitsubishi has almost pulled out of North America altogether. If you look at Mitsubishi's lineup today, it consists of three crossovers, all pretty much the same, and the Mirage. The company is not really pushing the envelope with new technology like it did in the 90s. None of these cars really appeal to American buyers, especially when there's a Subaru dealer right across the street. You don't see ads for Mitsubishi, you don't see Mitsubishis on the street, and you don't see dealerships. For all intents and purposes, this company no longer exists in the American car market. At least, not as a badge. In late 2019, Mitsubishi announced they'll be partnering with Nissan to help build vehicles and innovate new technologies. It's strange, because this isn't a buyout from the Nissan Renault Group, it's actually a partnership where Mitsubishi is going to help build some of their vehicles on their assembly lines. Really, who knows what this partnership holds for the future? Considering Mitsubishi does not have a single performance car out right now, they would need something big to drum up sales. Realistically, they'll probably halt production of their vehicles by the end of the decade, help Nissan and Renault develop their EV tech some more and go back to what they do best, building the greatest air conditioners on the market. I know we're all hoping for an Evo 11, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Not like you can hold your mouse and go click that subscribe button so you don't miss any topics covered in the future. If you have any ideas for episodes, feel free to let me know in the comments below. But until next time, make sure you get out in that garage and build your car. Don't buy it. All we do is making deals. Pull up and get you a deal. All we do is making deals. We got our milk on the track. I ain't leave my hat this morning for nothing. We selling cars today. Pull up on me and get you a new whip. We selling cars.